first uh, plenary now on disaster and restoration from Katrina and BP to Sandy and the next big one. I'd like to Chris Dorsett is the organizer and moderator for this panel. Chris Dorsett from the Ocean Conservancy. Well, thank you, David, and uh, welcome to our panel. I appreciate uh, everyone filing in in an orderly fashion to talk about disasters. Um, so you know, the thing about um, ocean and coastal disasters is why, while we don't know where exactly the next one will take place or when exactly it will take place, we do know that it will take place. When you think about things like hurricanes, um, the effects of climate change likely to make hurricanes uh, more intense uh, and, and occur at a greater frequency. Um, and then you look at things like the BP oil disaster, uh, the Exxon Valdez before it. Um, it brings up, in my mind, two really key questions. And the first is, in terms of uh, response, are we, do we have the right laws, policies, and response plans in place to uh, effectively respond to these disasters. And then the second is, with disasters, uh, there's normally an opportunity to rethink our policies as well as to invest in restoration of large marine ecosystems uh, with regards to um, economic and ecological damage that occurs from the disasters. Um, the BP Deepwater Horizon oil disaster is, is just one example of this. Um, there potentially will be billions of dollars on the table to restore the health of the Gulf region. And that includes both investments in um, uh, economic uh, productivity as well as the ecological health uh, and resilience of the Gulf system and its coastal communities. So what we're going to do today in this panel um, is, is address these two questions. Um, based on first-hand experiences with the BP Deepwater Horizon oil disaster and hurricanes uh, Sandy and Katrina. And we're very fortunate to have um, four panelists um, who have significant experience with uh, one or, or all of these disasters um, that will share their perspectives on these two questions of uh, response, are we, are we ready for the next one, and second, um, how to best engage in restoration activities uh, associated with it. So um, what we'll do in terms of logistics of the panel is we'll start, each, each presenter will give a roughly 10 minute presentation uh, and then we'll run through all four presenters and then what we'll do is we'll have a moderated conversation um, with the audience. We wanna leave as much time for that as possible. We want this to be a very interactive conversation as opposed to just um, us up here talking at you all. So um, if, if you can just hold questions until we get to that portion of the agenda, um, I'd appreciate it. So let me introduce the speakers really quickly and then um, they will come up and uh, give their respective presentations. Um, so first we have um, Eric Schwab, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary for Conservation and Management um, for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and in that role, he drives policy and program direction for NOAA's stewardship responsibilities, including ocean resource management, coastal management, management and protective resources. Um, second will be Clay Maitland, who's the founding chairman of the North American Maritime Environment Protection Association, which is a maritime industry-led initiative which engages maritime businesses, government, and the public to save our seas by promoting sound environmental practices. Third, we're going to have Cynthia Sartu, who's the Executive Director of the Gulf Restoration Network, which is a diverse network committed to uniting and empowering people to protect and restore the resources of the Gulf region. And then finally, will be Debbie Mance, who's the Executive Director of New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, which is a conservation advocacy organization dedicated to protecting, preserving, and restoring the Hudson Raritan Estuary. I want to give special thanks to Debbie for um, uh, last minute uh, pinch hitting for Cindy Zip. So thank you, Debbie. So without further ado, I'm going to um, turn it over to Eric Schwab to get us started. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. 
uh, from a, to talk a little bit uh, about this uh, disaster uh, response and restoration issue from a NOAA perspective. Uh, I guess I would start out by saying that um, the, the, the disaster part we seem to be getting down with um, unfortunately ever uh, greater frequency. Uh, the, me the immediate response part we feel like we're doing a little better with. Uh, it's the restoration part that presents really the, the longer term challenges for all of us that I think present um, not only a great challenge but also great opportunity. Uh, but it's the restoration component that re remains um, still very much a work in progress and, and still very much a, uh, uh, a set of circumstances um, that we're all having to very aggressively work through. Uh, as Chris said, I um, am, am at NOAA. I came to NOAA about three and a half years ago uh, as the head of the National Marine Fisheries Service. For those of you that might be keeping track, uh, three and a half years ago was about um, two months before the uh, before the um, Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, so we were very quickly um, early in the administration under uh, Dr. Luchenko and the rest of the leadership team there um, thrust into uh, an event that I'll speak about uh, momentarily. Uh, but in addition to that, um, we have also come in at a time when, as Chris indicated, there are um, increasing events in our coastal areas um, from, a, from a natural perspective and I'll speak um, a little bit about Sandy. I just, the only thing I want to note um, from this introductory slide is um, that this house uh, in the center here, uh, which is in Manaloking, New Jersey. Uh, uh, Debbie, are you familiar with this house? I think that slide is safe for the <laughs> Okay, well take careful note, there'll be a test. Uh, but um, this house uh, is, um, is noteworthy, even the FEMA, folks were um, surprised by the degree to which it withstood um, events of uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy, um, partly because of its particular construction. But as you'll see from the surrounding areas, um, there are other challenges there that um, the construction of that house alone won't attend to. Uh, I do want to note um, that you know, as, as uh, Chris, I think, indicated a little bit, um, the uh, propensity for ever-increasing numbers and magnitudes of disaster um, seems to be growing significantly. You know, our coasts are at the, at the economic and cultural hearts of much of the U.S. Uh, Ninety percent of the goods uh, that, that are consumed in the U.S. come through coastal ports. Uh, an increasing percentage of our population lives in the coasts, and they are increasingly vulnerable to these kinds of events. Uh, so, you know, NOAA's NCDC noted 14 weather and climate related disasters in 2011 with over $1 billion in damage each. Um, you see some of that reflected here. What you don't see here is, uh, is calendar 12. Uh, where another 11 disasters with over a billion dollars in damage occurred. Um, so this is a fact of life for us going forward. Um, extreme weather uh, does tend to magnify in our coasts where we not only have uh, large population centers, but they're in increasingly vulnerable areas. Of course, as, uh, as you note from the topic of, of uh, of the, uh, of the uh, session here, uh, natural disasters alone are not our challenge. Uh, increasingly man-made disasters also are a huge concern. Uh, disasters along our coasts uh, require not only quick response, uh, but they require technical response, and they require then uh, immediate help to affected communities, uh, but in the longer term, as I indicated in my opening comment, they require long-term restoration efforts. And so I'm going to focus a little bit here on uh, the outcome of the Deepwater Horizon. You know, NOAA as a, uh, was, was there pretty quickly. We were there pretty quickly to aid in the response. We were there pretty quickly to um, aid in other aspects of protecting uh, human health and economic concerns um, during the course of the event, notably uh, some of our work associated with, um, with seafood safety. 
uh, but we were also there very early to, um, to me begin to measure the impact of that event um, so that we could help inform uh, long-term restoration uh, actions as well as, uh, as assigning long-term restoration responsibilities and penalties. Uh, so I'm just going to talk uh, briefly about uh, a couple of those elements. Uh, one of those is the Restore Act. Uh, about, um, about a year into the effort, Congress uh, determined um, through, uh, through an act that 80% uh, of the penalties that might arise from, um, from, clean, from uh, 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 clean Water Act penalties associated with um, uh, the, um, the, the event uh, would go into a special fund. Um, that special fund is designed to um, be administered by a restore council to restore and conserve habitat, protect water quality, uh, replenish and protect living coastal and marine resources, uh, and uh, enhance long-term community resiliency and protect economic values in these coastal areas. Uh, the restore council has only begun um, in its deliberations um, within the last, uh, with, within, really heavily within the last eight or nine months. Um, they are soon due to put out a comprehensive plan that will be subject to further public input as an initial step in how um, the monies that, um, for the large part, are only just beginning to arise will be utilized um, to these long-term restoration purposes. Uh, and this is going to be an opportunity um, for everyone in this room uh, to, com to continue to comment both on the use of these funds, um, but specifically under the, plan the comprehensive plan that's going to be put out for further comment uh, to help guide uh, the most effective use of um, what, as Chris indicated, um, in the case of Restore Council, could certainly number um, in the billions of dollars, uh, and those Restore Council funds alone um, are only a part of the picture. The other thing that I will mention very briefly is that um, there are two other big elements of, um, of, the, of the restoration process. Uh, one was a criminal plea agreement uh, with two of the major responsible parties um, that will, that will uh, primarily through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation guide about $2.5 billion in criminal penalties uh, to restoration activities in the five affected states. Um, that is also a process that is very much in its early stages of um, both funding and design. And then finally, um, as a part of that early assessment process, uh, we began and have sponsored essentially the, um, the uh, uh, natural resource damage assessment process, uh, which looks at um, holding the responsible parties accountable to restore public resources uh, back to their condition uh, in, in advance of the event. Um, and so the, uh, so the three big elements, the Restore Council, the Natural Resources Damage Assessment, and the criminal funds um, being directed by the, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, will all play an important role in um, not only meeting these, in meeting these kinds of goals across the Gulf region. So I did want to say a few words about, um, about go back to Sandy for a moment. Um, you know, I think that Sandy is potentially um, building upon the events of Katrina back in 2005, uh, uh, Hurricane Rita, but hot on the heels of Katrina, uh, but very prominently in the post-Sandy um, discussion, there has been, I, I think, a significantly heightened awareness of the kinds of challenges that our coasts face, um, the frequency with which we might face them, and what it is, in fact, that we have that that, that over the long term we uh, need to do about them, and I think that uh, and, and and Debbie may have some more firsthand perspective on this um, that um, the the nature of the discussion up there um, in the Mid Atlantic has decidedly shifting from we are going to rebuild this place exactly the the way it was. Uh, to we're going to try to rebuild this place um, to the greatest degree possible the way it was from a community and economic perspective, but we're going to do so with a heightened sensitivity to uh, the kinds of challenges that we might be seeing more frequently going forward. And so I think that, um, and how, how am I doing? I know I want to be very careful about my time. 
I'm perfectly on two minutes, thank you. Because I do think the most important part of this will be our Q&A, so I want to be responsive to this. But I do think that the Sandy restoration process will really take place in a number of different, at a number of different scales that are going to be instructive, not only to communities in the Mid-Atlantic that are dealing with this issue in the here and now, but to other communities that might face similar circumstances in the future. The first is a very large scale understanding of the kinds of potential inundation issues that might arise as a result of sea level rise, increasing storm events, and the storm surge associated with those increasing events. And so one of the things that NOAA has done is produce the digital coast, which allows local communities around the country to, on their own, to support planning, look at different sea level rise scenarios and their potential to affect coastal areas, particularly low lying coastal areas, on a broad regional scale. These are important planning tools locally, these are important planning tools regionally, and they're also important information resources to be used by people who want to be engaged in the process. The second part of this is from a community perspective. When you go into some of these communities, increasingly what you see is it's not just the construct of a particular building that is the determining factor in how that community responds, but it's the integration of what we like to call the green and the gray infrastructure in ways that allow water to either be diverted, absorbed, or moved across a landscape during and after a storm event. So increasingly, and this is where we've made great progress with a number of our other federal agency brethren, and I've had great conversations with community planners and local officials, we need to think about integrating things like natural or constructed wetlands, the right kind of beach restoration projects, the right kinds of other natural features in a landscape that might allow a built community to exist more effectively. And I'm about out of time, so I'm going to not go into detail on this sort of multiple line of defense scenario, but I'm just going to close with the comment that as we look ahead, we look ahead at challenges that are going to incur in certainly greater frequency, but likely in greater intensity, and in ways that are going to require us to think differently about that disaster response restoration continuum. And hopefully you can all, by virtue of the conversation that we're going to have here over the next few minutes, be better equipped to participate in that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. We'll now turn it over to Clay Mayne. Thank you very much. Anyone who knows, there are three lawyers here. One, two, three. I'm not a lawyer. So you've outed us. The timekeeper is going to have her work cut out for her. I'll try to keep within the ten minutes. I spent most of my career, actually, as a lawyer, representing or working for various private sector businesses. So it may come as a surprise that some of the things I'm going to say are radical, the kind of things you don't hear even at a conference like this, but I'm going to say them anyway. My text, like that of the previous speaker, is largely about the Deepwater Horizon or Macondo well blowout. But it could just as easily be about Exxon Valdez. It could be about the recurring problems that we have in this country and elsewhere in the world with violations of the Marpol Convention. I assume most of us know what the Marpol Convention is. It's the International Convention on Prevention of Green Pollution. The United States has ratified that convention. It is part of the law of the land. Much of it is embodied in the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which actually was enacted in 1991, and which was the byproduct, a major one, not 
the only one of the Exxon Valdez disaster in Prince William Sound. There are, I would suggest, uh, and taking uh, uh, Senator Whitehouse's very uh, eloquent words of this morning, uh, yes, we can. There are things that we can do. One is to address what I call the four lacks. Lack of situational awareness, lack of preparedness, lack of willingness to pay for preparedness, lack of accountability. Those four lacks were the cause of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, including the loss of life, including the comprehensive pollution. They are also the cause of other forms of pollution, including runoff, much of the oil, as you probably know, two-thirds of the oil pollution of our waters, fresh and salt, come from runoff from the land. They also come very much from the two-stroke engine that characterizes most recreational watercraft, and, and of course that includes jet skis and the like. These, this, these problems that I've just indicated very briefly are not being addressed by Congress. They're not being addressed by the state legislatures. The lack of situational awareness, uh, BP, Tidewater, uh, Halliburton, didn't dream that they were going to be socked with what is now a 50 to 60 billion dollar and growing liability bill. And that includes, my friends, the legal fees, which have been an enormous and are growing. You know, us lawyers are not ha unhappy about that, but some of the people at you BP know, might be. And the question you might ask is, how could they not have foreseen this? How could they not have realized this? And why haven't more heads rolled? Another question. I said lack of accountability. If you turn to today's newspapers, or whatever means you use to gather the news, you'll read about Dodd-Frank, and you'll read about the travails of uh, J.P. Morgan. There does exist legislation in this country which imposes responsibility when things go wrong to, upon senior management. The environmental area, and particularly the marine environmental area, is one of the areas subjects where that is not the case. When there is an oil spill, when there is an oil water separated violation, when there is even, you saw it with the deep water horizon, which was something more than a spill, uh, and it was really not the rig, it was the well that was at fault and was improperly drilled. Who got, who's getting prosecuted now? It's either lower management or middle management. Senior management basically walked away from them. We need to understand this, and when we go up to the Hill tomorrow to talk to our representatives and congressmen, and I'll be there with or without this neck down. And I'm definitely going to say one of the things that I'm going to say, and as I say, I'm a businessman, is how about accountability? Now, as was pointed out this morning, and I think it was uh, Senator Whitehouse who pointed it out, we're up against very powerful lobbies. And the major lobbies that exist will resist to the death accountability focused on senior management. But the Oil Pollution Act was written at a different time. The Clean Water Act was written at a different time. We heard a few minutes ago about criminal penalties, but those criminal penalties are fines. They're not jail time. With very, very rare exceptions, and I think maybe one that I can think of, there's been no jail sentence for any kind of Marpol Annex 1 violation. And again, I say that's U.S. law. So that's, with the time I have, how much time do I have? Two more minutes? Three. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to point out to you that we need to look at the legislation. We need to learn from the experience that we've had. Uh, it's often said, and I think rightly, that environmental law progresses from disaster to disaster, particularly in the area of oil spills, but not just oil spills. We need to bear that in mind. We need to get rid of the two-stroke engine. If we do that, that's something to talk to Congress about tomorrow. Recreational boating becomes less of a pollutant. 
I mean, we're not talking about getting rid of recreational boating. We're not getting rid of the jet ski, but we are addressing a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, those, I think, are the salient points, the takeaways, that I hope that what I'm saying will, will be helpful. Thank you very much.
And the barrier islands are our first line of defense, which I think they will talk to you about in New Jersey and New York, too. They are our first line of defense. Wetlands are our second line of defense to storm surge. So, and this is what the U.S. Ge Geological Survey will tell you happened in one area of Louisiana. We lost 217 square miles of wetlands in that one day. All right? It just disappeared. And the habitat for fisheries is equally disappearing. Um, and the opportunities that arose, and I feel bad because I'm hearing the same stories from, from uh, Sandy, were that, you know, focuses on national resources on the impacted areas, so all of a sudden you got a national focus, they acknowledged the need for comprehensive planning, the need to, you know, increase your building codes, move the inshore, elevate, increase understanding of the value of coastal habitats, um, and then comes the reality which is all of a sudden they decide that, that the federal programs don't move in fast enough. They really didn't. They, they never moved in fast enough. For people to elevate, so people were exempted from elevation requirements. Building codes not, never got imposed because people had to rebuild and it was costly. Small businesses never did anything different because they couldn't get small business loans. Uh, loss of the tax base in many of these communities that lost a lot of homes uh, were really made them right for development. So a lot of these kind of visions of what would be all the little mom and pop stores and little mom and pop developments turned into major. And you know, one of their uh, arguments was, look at the tall buildings. They didn't suffer anything but three floors of damage. So if we build tall, hey, that would be safeguard all those people up above. So they're putting garages in the first three floors. The argument is that if you have garages, people will evacuate or you lose your car and everything else will be okay. Um, public emotions really inhibit discussion of real change. And I can, I can see this happening in New Jersey and New York potentially, which is at first people are open to change and then they go, oh, but that's my neighborhood. You don't want me to rebuild my neighborhood. You want to take out the, the school? You want to put green space in? Oh, no. Can't do that. That, that would be bad. Um, and then communities were told to build re rebuilding plans, but the government never adopted them, and there was never any money for implementation. So they were essentially put on the, on the shelf, and, and some people have implemented them on their own. And then, of course, we have the, which you can't see down below, which is people start really arguing, and we just had another push for this, for structural protection. It's not that we need to elevate, it's not that we need to think more comprehensively, it's that, oh my God, you need to build me a levy. Look, New Orleans got all that new levy protection, and if you'll build me a levy, I'll be just the same. Uh, without any understanding that really those levies will never be sufficient to keep you safe from all storms. It depends on where the storm comes from. I mean, after Katrina, Braithwaite was built. If you don't know this, and maybe y'all have never heard of Braithwaite, but Braithwaite was a community that was built after Katrina by people who got, who got flooded out in St. Bernard Parish. And somebody said, well, it, it ne that area where Breakway is, Blackman's Parish never flooded. So we'll build, rebuild in Breakway. So they re rebuilt in fast Breakway, and the last hurricane flooded them all out. So those people have been flooded out twice. So there's no long-term thinking. There never was any long-term thinking. And then there were the chemical spills. <coughs> Nobody ever thought about the need for storm protection of chem the chemical industry. And so these are the spills, and, and I don't know how many times I've heard of the oil industry telling me there were no spills after Katrina, but there were. So anyway, I have to move on because I'm running out of time. Um, and there was a lot of sewage infrastructure that was destroyed, and I can tell you that the money after Katrina was put into new development, and the old issues that the Bay of Luxy were never addressed, the old issues of infrastructure were never addressed. Everything went into the potential for new development. Um, and the federal officials, and then I'll move on to BP, I'm sorry, but um, the federal officials kept saying, well, we don't want to be too enforced the environmental laws too much because we might be seeing a standing in the way of restoration. Mm -hmm. So you didn't get a lot of backstop from the federal agencies because they were so concerned about being seen as an impediment to restoration. And then we go to the BP drilling disaster, and, uh, and I have to tell you, I mean, this is a whole different story. One of the frustrations for most communities, including local parishes, was the federal government was in charge, but they really put BP in charge. And so the federal government was really not in charge. And there may be, this is how much was actually uh, implicated or impacted by the BP disaster. Um, 
coastlines from Louisiana to Florida, 1,774 miles in total of oil. This is what it looked like. Uh, and this is a really bad thing, but insufficient personnel or expertise by the agents, agencies to enforce the law. Issuance of a notice of select season in 2008 to waive some of those laws. Approval of DP's regional oil response plan, despite the fact that they grossly exaggerated what they could um, actually skim. They said they could skim 20 million gallons per day. They never got close to 10% of that. Um, and the claim that within hours they would have personnel out there that were able to deal with it. And then this, if you haven't seen this, Chris said I had to put this. They had a backup plan that listed the, as impacted species in the Gulf seals, sea otters, and walruses. So we have a t-shirt that if you ever see it, it says, save the Gulf walrus, because we didn't know they existed, but we want to save them. So they, their plan that was approved by mineral management service, the agency in charge, had this, and nobody talked about it. So talk about regular, reg, the lack of reg, regulatory oversight. So the Oil Spill Commission, and I'm not going to go through all of them because it's short time, came up with all of these you know, what they needed to do, safeguards that needed to be implemented. They actually called for a regional citizen advisory committee, which we can't even get Congress to talk about. So, like Prince William Sound got, so we're going to try to talk to them again. And recently, this is the grade, these are the grades that, that the uh, commission gave the administration, the industry, and Congress, and we think there was a lot of grading inflation. But, uh, the administration has done pretty good, but we are hearing that they have not funded the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BC, the Bureau of Energy Security Enforcement, at sufficient level to do independent audits, so they're now sort of relying on industry self-audits. We just had a whistleblower tell us that it's amazing what has been going on. I'm going to go just a little bit over Crystal. Uh, industry, they supposedly continue to in increase their ability to improve safety and ability for spills, but we haven't seen a lot of it other than their ability to supposedly cap a disaster. I mean, we haven't seen a lot more equipment deployed, we haven't seen a lot of training, and we haven't seen them really put any money into developing these technologies, uh, which makes me nervous because the Coast Guard is after the last disaster told me that burning oil was their new technology that they thought was developed after the Exxon Valdez. So, you know, it, it's not a, having to put a, a something on oil to burn it in, in the sea and then burning the turtles alive is not what I think. <coughs> And then, in terms of Congress, the only thing they did was pass legislation, which we thank them for, for bringing money to the Gulf for restoration, but they haven't done a single thing, including adopt the administration's regulations for uh, oversight of the oil industry that would make oil and gas development safe. And so this is what we continue to see, and I'll end with these as I show them to you. This is, this is my staff going out and documenting this. This is, you know, February 2013, March 2013. We just continue to see it. And then we continue to see this. We're seeing red snapper has more source than it's ever had. We have coral that's dead or dying from one of the dispersants. We have, you know, we're waiting to see what happens. This is a, a whale shark. We're out in the Gulf. And this is what they've done. <coughs> But without help and oversight, we're not going to be able to make sure that this happens. And, and we can tell you a horror story. This money goes straight to the state. That really has us concerned. And then the others. And our biggest concern, and I'm going to say this, because I need you all help with this, is we just had natural resource damage assessment, early restoration project list issue. And one of those projects is a hotel and convention center in Alabama. Now that's a natural damage assessment project. So if that's what we're getting through NERDA, what do you think we're going to get through resort? How bad do you think those projects are going to be in terms of economic development over environmental restoration? So it's a complicated thing, but we really need help by with people from by people helping us to oversee and watch all this process to make sure that the environment actually gets money. And though I thank NOAA for all their efforts, I will tell you that there has not been one marine restoration project put forward or funded to this day. And this disaster happened in the marine environment. We're very concerned about that. So I'll leave you with this burn welcome to the Gulf of Mexico. Thank
thank you. I wish I had been on time. I think I've just seen my future, and I'm not that excited about it. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Post Sandy in uh, the New York and New Jersey area, and you've seen some of these photos before. Uh, my group works on the more urban coast of New York and New Jersey, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with what happened on the Jersey Shore. There's a lot of coverage on that. I'm going to spend a little time just showing you um, more of our blue-collar primary um, residents and our urban shoreline. And we saw some of these photos, but this is Staten Island. You know, we had tankers come ashore. Here's the larger view of the Eric where you saw, uh, showed that house. This is the breach of the barrier island that is on the Jersey Shore. I think Eric had this one as well. I don't, all our New York City taxis. And then this is um, two photos of a community on the Raritan Bay Shore, Old Bridge. Very much a blue collar town. And this is kind of an iconic photo that a lot of folks saw. So this is, this is what happened um, in our communities. And we just passed the six month anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. And we put together, it might be hard to see, I apologize, I'll walk through it, this um, visual in our office, um, this was done by a lawyer, so <laughs> we need some GIS talent. But it's really to demonstrate, um, so again, just to orientate you, if you're not familiar, this is Newark Bay, um, coming around, this is Peninsula, and over here you'd have New York and Jersey Harbor, this is Staten Island, Kill Van Cole, Arthur Kill, coming down into the Raritan Bay. And um, the storm came in and the wind was blowing, so it really, um, all the impact from the storm surge came in into New Jersey. We had two of our largest wastewater treatment plants in New Jersey um, go offline for several weeks. Passaic Valley sewage up in Newark, um, it's you know, over 300 million gallons per day. Uh, that was offline, storm surge of about 10 feet into this very urban area, I mean this is Newark. And this is the tidal river, the Pacific River. And then a similar, um, all the pump stations went down with the Middlesex County Utilities Authority, which is down here, sorry. Um, and that, uh, so the plant was fine, it was elevated, the pump stations couldn't get the waste, and so they just discharged raw sewage. That closed down the clam beds in Raritan Bay for five months. So that's during the, the height of the season there. And then separately, we had three oil spills, which after the scene of sin wasn't significant. But this is a major, um, this border here is a major really industrial area, refineries, tank farms. That was, um, no one knew. And so, um, you know, that was something that we were trying to work on as, a, as an advocacy group to make sure that story got out. At the same time, our office was down um, without power. But uh, this is a major port um, of New York and Jersey Harbor, and we had significant damage in this area as well as along the Jersey Shore. And just looking more carefully, uh, the report just came out, estimated 11 billion uh, gallons of untreated or partially treated raw sewage was released during the storm from New Jersey, um, and New York City uh, contributed the majority of that waste. And um, this is Bill Schultz, our Raritan Riverkeeper, and this is a waterfront park on the Arthur Kill. There's Staten Island. Oh, yeah, here's the notice. Uh, please don't go on the beach. This is definitely not a beach. But the, what this really demonstrates was a real lack of notification by the state agencies and, of, um, and it was very late. Yeah, telling folks, don't go near the water. There's raw sewage in it. There's oil. We were, you know, there's people fishing right here. So it wasn't in multiple languages. This is an example of the immediate response of what we've determined is not very adequate at all. Um, a second example, just to show you, uh, this is, you know, even though we're a port area um, and very industrialized, we have all these great pockets of ecosystems. And this is an oil spill that got its way back in the Smith Creek. It's a tributary of the Arthur Kill. Um, had, had been the site of a restoration project, I think in conjunction with NOAA. 
Um, and so we'll have to see how that, that survives. But um, you know, people didn't, didn't know about that. And it's, you know, we have to tell the story about the ecosystem that you know, is here with this port. So it's a lot of words, sorry. Um, I was asked to just kind of talk about what, what, what needs to happen. And um, this is our quick take on it. Nothing new, from, I mean, this is the sad part, nothing new from sin, right? Increased resiliency of critical infrastructure. We had major, major uh, failures at our wastewater treatment plants, our refineries, our industrial facilities, um, power stations, all of that's located on the waterfront in New Jersey and New York. Um, one of the things that's gonna, that's gonna happen with uh, supplemental money that came through, EPA has a few million dollars to put towards wastewater treatment plants and drinking water facilities for backup power, including renewable sources. In New Jersey, one, the power got flooded. I mean, people were still trying to power down the plant, wastewater treatment plant in Newark, when the storm surge came in, and they almost lost their lives. They just had to evacuate the facility, and it got completely overrun, and um, they lost their administration building, all their communications, their power, and when they went to get the generators for all these treatment plants, they ran out of gas, because as you know, as you saw, we had a lot of problems with distribution of gas and fuel at that time. So EPA is encouraging these folks to get renewable sources of backup power at an elevated spot. Um, I can tell you we don't have enough space in this metro area to rebuild wastewater treatment plants at a higher elevation. And then the other thing is a redundancy with the pumps. Um, huge problem with our uh, pump stations to the wastewater treatment plants. Again, increased communication to the public in multiple sources. I mean, all our phones were down. I mean, it was great after 10 days to get you know, a notice from my electric company over my phone that my power was out. Um, we picked that up and then 10 days later and the power came back on. And then um, we have county mitigation plans. Now they're being told, you know, you need to incorporate resiliency and sea level rise into those county mitigation plans. Those get reviewed every five years, so it's an iterative process that they'll start doing. And then, um, again, the, 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 B, the breast management practices at the waterfront industrial facilities, this goes hand in hand with worker safety. We had flooding in um, Newark, which is a very uh, underserved community, uh, lots of low income folks. In their basements, they had no idea what was in that water because it had come through the industrial waterfront, through the active chemical facilities, raw sewage, which first responders were not notified about, and then um, into the basements of a, of a, a local neighborhood. And um, it took several days uh, before actually the EPA came out to assess the water. By then, it was difficult to say what was from the storm and what was from inside the house, but the state really was non-responsive to that. I think they were extremely overwhelmed um, with that. Um, so Tim Dillingham of the American Littoral Society has kind of coined this phrase, so I have to give him credit, bending the arc of the recovery. That's what we're trying to do up in um, New York and, and New Jersey. So don't just rebuild, rebuild smarter. So we're advocating wastewater treatment plants. If you're gonna pour millions of dollars into these existing facilities, bring them into compliance with the Clean Water Act. We still have general permits for combined sewer overflows in New Jersey, and we know facilities have sh uh, plans on the shelf that could increase their capacity and also address combined sewers. So we're trying to advocate to have flexibility in the funding to allow those upgrades to occur. Um, also, obviously incorporate green infrastructure, especially in our urban communities. This makes an amazing amount of sense but you'd be amazed, oh, I don't know if that fits in our box, and can we get the funding to fit that, or we have to put it all towards just rebuilding. Clearly, we need leadership on strategic retreat and buyout programs. Buyout was not even part of the initial conversation in New Jersey. Governor Cuomo in New York put it on the table right away with a dollar amount, was out in the communities talking to folks. Um, this didn't happen in New Jersey for a while. Um, it's all about rebuilding, and um, so I'm, you know, well, as I walk through this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between New York and New Jersey without getting too political about it. But um, for example, in New Jersey, 
climate change, sea level rise, we've had our coastal program and our state agency dissolve. Uh, we don't talk about climate change in, in New Jersey with the administration. I'm not even sure there's people who believe in it. And then separately, when you look at New York, they just put an RFP out to talk about coastal green infrastructure for New York City. What else do we need to know? What's the research needed for science and um, technical looks on that? And then, um, again, restore the natural features and soften our coastlines and make those tools and regulations available everywhere. Oftentimes in our area, we get separate standards for urban coastlines versus more shore coastlines. You can't do living or shorelines in the urban area. That, that's not going to work. We are making sure that happens. Um, so far, the planning aspects have really been placeholders uh, in the action plans that have been submitted by the state to HUD. And, um, you know, the real mantra has been rebuild. Again, this goes at loss of rateable in these communities, and the mayors don't want to see that happen. They're not sure what can happen. We have adopted the FEMA map um, in New Jersey, so the rebuilding is supposed to occur at elevated levels. But then we just had legislation introduced to allow building on piers in high hazard areas. So, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. And then finally, just to, to wrap up, um, what happens next? So we're anxiously awaiting the launch of the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. This was the task force created by President Obama's executive order in December, and it's chaired by HUD. Um, it has 15 members of federal agencies, and it's supposed to coordinate, you know, the 60 billion, now less, money that was authorized by Congress. And um, they're supposed to have their deliverables by August 2nd, 2013. So we've had state uh, people that have been appointed to represent the, the task force, and they've done a lot of pre-meetings, but they haven't officially kicked off the task force because um, they want to get a, they have a very short time window in which to do their deliverables. So hopefully um, we'll see some of the things that we're talking about recommended in there. But so far, we have such strong governors in our two states. There's, there's not been a lot of push from HUD or the federal government to say, maybe we should think about this a little bit more. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's give a quick round of applause to all of our panelists for uh, And uh, open it up to questions. Phil?
sort of three major venues for um, action uh, in the restoration arena. Um, the first is NERDA. Um, Sin represent, re noted the one early action project um, that is geared toward lost public use. So NERDA um, basically is put things, uh, you know, address the public trust losses. And the public trust losses are, you know, to fish, to wildlife, to habitats and ecosystems, and also to, to lost recreational use. Um, so everybody in this room can go to the, um, to the NOAA website, um, can get access to the early action project list that was just released, um, can see the project that Sindra um, noted, it, which is intended to, to, to compensate for lost recreational use, um, along with all the other um, shoreline stabilization and restoration projects that are in an early action effort. Um, the early action is a, was a new creation under this Deepwater Horizon natural resources um, damage um, uh, event, um, recognizing that there are you know billions of dollars worth of losses that need to be documented and ultimately potentially taken to trial. Um, but in the meantime, there can be some early action that both um, the agencies, the trustees, including the states, and BP um, would agree that um, could be taken now and credited against any kind of ultimate sort of damage settlement or claim. So that's one. You can watch that website and you can engage in that process. You can weigh in on um, the narrative process as it goes forward. Second is this Restore Council. I would just emphasize I mentioned uh, the comprehensive plan is going to come out um, sometime very soon, a matter of um, weeks to a month or two, uh, there is going to be explicitly with that comprehensive plan release an invitation for additional public input. And I would, I would encourage everybody to take advantage of that. Um, and then the third piece is the, um, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation administration of the um, criminal, uh, the criminal penalty um, funds. Um, in Louisiana, they're directed specifically to the existing master plan and some of the other coastal planning um, efforts that have already been placed there. Um, in the other states, it's a little more open and engaging um, directly with uh, NIFWIF and the states as sponsors of projects that might come to pass um, under those, um, un under the, through those funds um, is, uh, is an opportunity that is in front of everybody. The vast majority of the restoration money that is coming is not here yet, um, so there's plenty of opportunity to engage, to monitor, to um, provide suggestions. Sorry for a bit of a long answer there. So right behind, Phil, sorry. I was wondering if any of you think that the construction of the Keystone Pipeline will reduce the number of marine oil wells. No. I mean, it, it, whether or not it's built, the Gulf is going to get the impact. All right, we've been told that resistance to the pipeline is resulting in barging of that tar sands to Mobile for a pipeline. They're building a pipeline from Mobile Harbor to Pascagoula, Mississippi to refine it. So instead of going to Texas and Louisiana, they're going to go down and go to Mississippi and refine it, or they're going to barge it down the Mississippi River, which means that there's going to be even larger potential for harm in the Mississippi River because we have quite a bit of accidents in the river once the water is high. So, I mean, either way you go, there's a potential for, for oil, you know, impacts because the industry has decided from hell or high water they're going to refine the tar sands. They don't care if they have a pipeline. So, I mean, you know, it's, you deal with the oil industry. I mean, I think people should understand when people talk about a powerful lobby, what I think is more, uh, even more important for people to understand is that the oil industry brings into the United States revenue second only to the IRS, okay? So it is the second largest part of, pot of money that the federal government receives. And that's why during the BP disaster, MMS sold several leases to BP. So there's never been a debarment until the EPA took action a BP from oil and gas development in the Gulf, even during the disaster. So, you know, I mean, I dealt with the oil industry long enough that, like I said, stop the Keystone Pipeline is not going to stop the oil coming from the Gulf. It's just going to stop the impact from that pipeline. 
anyone else want to? Well, I think that it's, I agree, but I think that, again, there are a lot of legislative things that can be done. I also agree that the oil industry is fighting them tooth and nail, but there is, we saw, getting back to Deepwater Horizon, the real problem after the blowout was the fact that the so-called blowout preventer didn't work and had never been adequately tested. Nobody bothered to spend the money on that. A lot of money is now being spent by the oil industry on blowout preventer technology, which is a wonderful thing, but we had to wait until after the events of April 20, 2010, for that to happen. The important thing is, and I think, you know, we tend to get pessimistic at these conferences. I don't know if you noticed, but Congressman Markey is speaking. He will probably be elected to the Senate from the state of Massachusetts. I would be willing to bet he will be. There is a growing body of opinion in the Senate, and possibly even the House of Representatives, for in support of strong, call it an environmental caucus, call it a marine environmental caucus. This is happening. There is political hope in this country. One of the things that you need to remember, I think we all need to remember, is that oil companies really don't vote. There are a lot more votes tied up in this room and in the environmental community. Take a look at an outfit like Audubon, which I've been a member of since I was about eight years old. That's a much more powerful voting bloc than the oil companies, with certain exceptions, possibly within certain parts of the state of Louisiana. But, all right. Nationally, the strength is with the environmental movement. I think we need to be a little bit more optimistic about the possibilities that exist along the lines that we've been talking about. Accountability. We need to revisit the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. We need to reopen it. We need to look at accountability by individuals. Once you do that, you're going to have a situation like the banks now face with Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley for accountants. And when that happens, and I believe it will happen, it's going to happen, you're going to see a much more proactive environmental role and much more money being spent by big oil on exactly what we're talking about today. So don't despair. But at the same time, please understand what needs, you know, we need to be very clear about what needs to be done. Right here. So let me just repeat the question. I'm sorry, I missed the first half of it, or at least maybe some of the details. The first is regarding public involvement opportunities. Oh, that was just a thank you. Oh, okay. Right. I'm sorry, I understand people can't hear the questions. So categorical exemptions, and then just a quick summary of the first question, just so I can let people know. Oh, that's it. Okay. It's categorical exemptions. Sorry. Well, I mean, I guess my position is exactly yours. There are categorical exemptions for the oil industry in certain circumstances, and all of y'all missed it. Exxon announced last week that they're going into the deepest oil reserve ever hit in the Gulf, 30,000 feet below sea level. They're getting a permit. Do I think categorical exclusions should apply to that? No. It's my understanding they're being listed. There are also general permits for a lot of oil and gas development in terms of Clean Water Act permits. There are a lot of general permits and memorandum of understanding. Whistleblowers are coming forward now to tell me that people are using coffee filters before EPA comes out because they know when they're coming out. They're filtering their water through coffee filters. So I think that's a real concern. Thank you. 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 Th
copy the fruits so that they don't catch the discharges from those facilities, how they're still, you know, just sweeping the oil overboard at night and coming up real notice. So I think that regulation of the oil industry needs to be more rigorous. I think there needs to be personal accountability. I think there's not enough. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it's hard to regulate them. They're 50 to 100 miles offshore. Who knows what goes on in there, except the workers. And there's no incentive, there is no whistleblower law, so there is no incentive. I don't see I don't see how you can be cynical about Louisiana politics. I've studied it for years, <laughs> and it's squeaky clean. <laughs> challenged um, uh, to execute NEPA uh, under um, almost any kind of, a, you know, recent resource um, environment. Um, that, those are going to continue to be challenges. But the, but the one thing that I did want to say, and, and your question prompts me to say it, um, underlying in addition to the restoration opportunities, for example, in the Gulf, um, but underlying a lot of our decision making is our, our, our fundamental science questions. And in addition to the restoration opportunities in the Gulf, um, there is going to there is a tremendous amount of money that is being directed to science, and have, and, and and getting the right science, aggregating it, and making it available for um, reviewers and decision makers is an incredibly important part of what we need to do as a country and what we need to do as agencies. You know, ultimately. Um, some good, good sound science can be an antidote to a lot of bad decisions, um, both you know from an upfront sort of federal action that might lead to some bad outcomes, or from uh, the perspective of investment in the right restoration opportunities. And so we shouldn't um, forget the, the the need to continue to invest in, depend upon, um, and really have our hats in a lot of cases on um, on good sound science. Right here. Yeah, probably for Eric. Uh, you know, it seemed like Noah was one of the first agencies responding, and especially in habitat restoration laws. So the concern is the question would be where were the other agencies like Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and EPA, particularly when they showed about the flooded facilities, pollution from flooded facilities, and also you know, the vulnerability analysis, even going through the coastline and looking at that vulnerability. The question, I guess, is have has the response, is the response coordinated with various agencies like EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and others in a very coordinated, direct effort, immediate effort, or is it still going to be the same process to go, oh, well, this response doesn't do So can I just repeat it really quick? Oh, yeah, so sure. people know. Um, so the question is in regards to the federal response and whether or not it's coordinated. Uh, you know, I think there's been tremendous improvement. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't, you know, still opportunities to do better. Uh, are you, were you speaking specifically to uh, Deepwater Horizon? Well, I guess I'm speaking to any of the disasters. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think, you know, there are different elements to that, right? So in um, the post-Sandy, you know, it's really um, where a lot of the response was um, social, socioeconomic response, you know, community impacts. Um, you know, there's a framework under FEMA um, that uh, that manages that process, and uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody involved would um, suggest it has done anything but improve dramatically um, since, for example, um, Katrina. Um, again, not that there aren't continued opportunities for improvement. When you talk about um, some of the uh, natural resource response, 
you know, again, there are different components to that. You know, there's the immediate rescue and uh, recovery of, you know, turtles and, and birds and, uh, you know, other related impacts. And then there's this, um, there's this baseline component, which is, you know, what, what did this event do to this resource so that we can hold the responsible parties accountable? Um, that started with Exxon Valdez um, in, in the oil uh, world. We have gotten much more sophisticated there. Um, huge amounts of effort from very early on in Deepwater Horizon went into beginning to, went into establishing that, um, that baseline and establishing that, that impact. That would be the foundation of um, either a, a, a NERDA settlement or a NERDA criminal or a NERDA, NERDA civil, civil trial um, looking down the road. Um, that's still very much a work in progress. You know, some of that science work because of the nature of the process um, leading to trial is not out in, in public view, but there's, there is a tremendous amount of work that has been done to, to assess that damage. I can tell you that um, being down there myself, I know that, um, that uh, EPA, that, uh, that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other interior agencies were very prominent from very early on down there in the Gulf Coast. Um, it was an overwhelming challenge for all of us, but, um, but there was a lot of um, uh, integrated effort to um, both respond as well as, you know, plan for um, some of these sort of long-term assessment and restoration challenges. Right here. Um, how do you stop the use of something like dispersants, which are really just a cosmetic approach to a problem, but leave a long-term damage to the environment? So the question is in regards to dispersants um, and how you stop use, uh, given its effectiveness. How do you stop using that impact to the long-term damage? The reason dispersants are being used is because nobody has come up with a better idea. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a better idea. That's what I was talking about when I made my, my brief uh, speech, but uh, that's a much better idea. Uh, one of the things that Carlene and I have done is to participate in a number of these oil spill response drills, some of which are quite elaborate. Uh, and by the way, on the subject of Deepwater Horizon, BP was never in control of the actual um, process. The process, which is a very detailed one and is, is actually embodied in federal law, is to get the polluter to pay. And the only way to get BP to pay, which they did uh, for the cleanup, such as it was, with all of its imperfections, was to put them front and center in the process, and that has been, that also was a product of Exxon Valdez. It's a very, very elaborate rule book on that. Uh, unfortunately, the Coast Guard got pilloried for that, but the use of dispersants, and they were widely used, a number of different things were used. We've gone through stages. Uh, the first was to burn, and that started with the Torrey Canyon off the coast of England in 1966. Uh, we've gone on to dispersants. Europe has gone in a different direction. They do not permit dispersants to be used. Uh, they use other things, but not dispersants. Um, science, we heard about a few minutes ago about science. Uh, we're waiting for something better, whether it is a kind of dispersant which does not have it constituted itself a biohazard, in other words, destruction. Uh, there are people out there, many people, who believe that dispersants are the solution. Dispersants are largely manufactured from petroleum, by the way, very much the same way. Uh, in other words, you're, you're basically using the hair of the dog that bit you. Uh, they're clearly very destructive to the marine environment. But again, the, we, we running, we're running out of alternatives. Uh, when a major catastrophe occurs, and Deepwater Horizon was an unprecedented one, unless you count what happened in Mexico years ago, uh, that's the problem. We go from disaster to disaster. Uh, this is the time now between disasters to address that problem. And we're not doing it. Anyone else want to take a stab at this person? Well, I mean, we disagree in part on who was actually in control and why. I mean, I understand the regulatory scheme, but, you know, when you're accosted by a BP employee telling you to leave an area because they're in charge, then you are pretty clear that it's not the Coast Guard, it's the BP professionals who are in charge. But in terms of Persons. Um, you know, I am really concerned as you are. We have tried to push for testing, testing under the oil 
sued over that, but the court decided we were time barred. EPA has promised us a, regu a new regulation. Very kind of that you should raise that. There are fact sheets on the back because EPA has stalled that process. They were actually going to move forward with comprehensive testing and dispersants under a new rule. That rule has stalled. It's not moving forward, and without you all's help, politically, we probably won't get it to move forward. And the Coast Guard has made noises about subsea application of dispersant is their new go-to mechanism for deep water spills. And we have been resisting that pretty significantly, but we probably also need y'all's, you know, because it's a national response plan. Part of it is national, what you do, not just regional. There's regional, there's a national approach, a regional approach, and a global approach. And, but I would agree that we are not putting enough money into technology development. And until we put enough money into technology development, we're just going to be waiting for the next disaster to happen and have somebody that's upset about technology and not moving forward. All right, so we have time for one more question. And so it doesn't look like I'm playing favorites. I want to go back to the back of the room. If anyone has a question back there. Does anyone have a question? Oh, in the middle, perfect. There you go. My concern is that their first line of approach is, you know, in Galveston Bay after they got hit, they're talking about the Great Wall of Galveston. And they're still talking about the Great Wall of Galveston. Communities in Louisiana, the first thing they do is say, if you would build us a levee, we would be safe. And it's really politically unpopular for local politicians to say, nah, you don't need a levee. You really need to try to deal with living with the natural environment. And so, you know, it's pretty thorny. And I suspect that they're going to find the same thing in New Jersey. The only reason we didn't have it in Mississippi, I will tell you, is because the Corps of Engineers said they couldn't build a wall big enough to stop a 22-foot surge. So what was the point of building a wall if you could, you know, if the surge would have just gone over it? So. I think, yeah, the only thing that's probably going to stop that big, giant tidal gate around New York City is the cost. But that's been floated. You know, cities like Hoboken, the mayor, who's very progressive, talked about a wall in Hoboken. And this is where we get at the regional planning. So you put up a berm or the wastewater treatment plant puts up a wall. Well, what happens to the fat rendering plant next door and the county prison behind that? And then on the shore, I'm sure you've seen all the news about the dunes. It's a huge issue. The Army Corps has millions of dollars to restore the beaches and the dunes in both New York and New Jersey. And people are holding out. They don't want their private property rights taken away or their view shed taken away by the dunes. And the neighbors are getting mad at neighbors. And there's a Supreme Court case going on in New Jersey right now. And the governor has been very outspoken on it. He wants these dunes to be built. So it's a huge issue. And it is all structural solutions, unfortunately, is what we're hearing about right now. Yeah, we had a local parent, just got to add this, that told me that building two levees with wetlands behind the first levee was multiplying the cost. So they were following what we wanted them to do. And they were going to get two levees. Right. So just quickly, I would say that there are certainly going to be places where hard shoreline is going to be the most cost effective. Those places are increasingly fewer. And we need to be looking more and more to building more resilient shorelines, living shorelines, if you will, that can both take a hit and rebound, absorb and deflect energy, but also migrate over time as sea level rise and inundation events increase. The last thing I would say is these things are very site specific. You can build perhaps a sea gate around Manhattan and it will work. You try to do the same thing in Key West, Billy, and where is the water going to go? Come right up through the ground. 
So, uh, you know, they're not uh, one size fits all. Last thing, a plug for my uh, home state in Maryland a few years ago. Um, they changed the law. And it used to be you had to prove that a, a living shoreline would be effective. Now you have to prove it won't be to allow you the opportunity to build some hardened shoreline. And um, that is, I think, um, uh, with a little bit of a home state pride, um, asserted uh, a much better approach. Well, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I suspect our speakers will be around.